Please pray with me. Holy God, we come this morning asking you to open our hearts to receive your ever-present love. In the name of that love, in the name of the triune God, amen. amen. What do you love? Better yet, think of someone you love. Whom do you love? Take a moment, think of someone. I wonder, do you have a special language for and with them? After 33 years together, my husband and I have a love language. I will not embarrass him or any of you by sharing some of those things that after all these decades we call each other. But I wonder, think of that person, if you have anyone in your life that you have a language with, your children, your spouse, friends. Another relational question, and I wonder if this sounds familiar to you, if you've ever done this, particularly with that person in your mind. You're in the middle of a story, and all of a sudden, there's something that is so important that you have to stop the story, you interrupt the story, and you tell them something pertinent fact, or it could be completely different, and you've interrupted your story. Anybody do that? All the time. All the time. Okay. So I'll give you an example. On the morning of my first brain surgery, even though Dave and I had prepared for three weeks from the diagnosis to the surgery day, talking and working. We're getting in the car, it's 5 a.m. in the garage, so picture this. And for some reason, I simply blurted out, oh, and, and don't forget, if things don't go well, I've given my body to science. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely awful. The timing could not have been more hard. So this morning, we come to the Gospel of John, and we witness a much more sensitive interruption to a traumatic time. It is Jesus' last meal with his disciples. During what has already been a very tense week, we know it as Monday Thursday. In this moment, Jesus has just washed the feet of his chosen friends. And then four things, four difficult things, happen in succession. He tells them that one of them will betray him after three years together, and Judas gets up and walks out. He tells them again, and more strongly, that he will only be with them a little longer, and they're not going to be able to follow. He gives them the impossible and simple new commandment to love each other in such a way that it differentiates them from other people. And then finally, he tells his most eager disciple, Peter, that Peter will deny him before the night is over. Hard, hard words for the disciples to hear. And then we come to the interruption of today. Jesus knows the disciples are confused and scared, so he pauses in the action. And in this gospel, we hear that Jesus, for the next three chapters, talks to his friends in a private love language that we get to overhear. A love language that they learned together during their three years. His message to his disciples is also meant for us that follow Christ today. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. We could stop right there and exhale. You see, the term believe encompasses so much more than intellectual assent. The Greek used here is a relational word. It comes from the word pistis, and it's about faith, and it's about an entrusting confidence and hope that's born of a deep personal relationship. And right away, Jesus says to his closest friends, that they are safely held in a relationship with God through him. Then, 
continuing to meet their fear of the future, Jesus says, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. So he's just told them that he's going away and they're not going to be able to follow. But here, he promises that eventually they will all be together again. Not only that, he extends his personal message to assure them there are many dwelling places. Does that sound familiar? Last week, we heard that Jesus said, I am the gate that leads to a pasture where all sheep are welcome. Inside his love language for his precious friends and us, in 16 words, he affirms his relationship with us and makes a kind of universalist promise that spreads beyond any exclusion. This past week, I attended the mandatory two-day clergy conference, which is an annual gathering of all the clergy of our diocese. It was a great gift to reconnect or to connect with my mentors and friends, and to spend time with some new friends, including the former rector of this beautiful place. What I've discovered over the years is that clergy conference often is difficult, especially now as so many of us are facing the challenges, my father would have called them opportunities. <laughs> I'll call them challenges, that are born from this global pandemic. We heard that over 40% of our parishes are in clergy transition. 40% are living through what you experienced here for three years. We heard that the majority of our parishes, like us, have part-time clergy. We heard how our House of Bishops needed to reissue their resolution from last year, condemning all transphobic legislation in now over 41 states. We strategized about how we can face the horrors of other growing pandemics, addiction, mental illness, gun violence, like we just read about in Dallas, racism, war, the collapse of civil discourse, the rampant use of disinformation. You can see why clergy conference is a little challenging. <laughs> we prayed for clarity about what the church, our church, can offer our world today. And then, in his final address, at the end of Tuesday night, Bishop Gates took us to John 14. Using Jesus' love language for those disciples in the upper room, Bishop Gates said, do not let your hearts be troubled. You could hear a pin drop. Believe in God. He reminded us that we have chosen to follow a risen Christ who is inside God and that God is inside us. That our belief, that word pistis, is about relationship after all. You know, I think that when dear Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going, how can we know the way? I think he is speaking in that intimate upper room, the universal fear we all have. God, what's happening? Where are you? Please don't leave us. How can you possibly continue? Whatever your personal anguish words are, insert here. And Jesus uses the most tender love language. Oh, Thomas. Oh, Brent, oh, Emmanuel, put your name in here. The way is a person. Me, I give you something you already have, my very person. Their private love language is, I am your way. I am your truth. I am your life, which we heard life, remember, last week is abundant. 
I think it's important when we come to John 14 to remember what theologian Nanette Sawyer wrote. It's not a language intended to exclude others, but rather language intended to embrace those closest to him, to comfort, to come to me, he says, come to God through me. Many people balk at the tender words in John 14, 6. I know I do, and still sometimes do. Because I was taught that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me is all about exclusion. Because mistakenly, I was taught to believe that it was a message for the wider world. No, it is intended in this intimate moment for us, Jesus' closest friends. For us this morning, wherever you are, whatever you're facing, Jesus is saying, <laughs> Jesus is saying, listen. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Great time. <laughs> the Holy Spirit, through Jesus and through Ula, is saying, <laughs> go ahead. Trust me. Go ahead and have the courage. Dare, dare to love me. Those of you who know me, who are getting to know me, know that I can say, I love Jesus Christ. For me, Jesus Christ is the face of God, the part of our Trinity that brings me into the heart of God. I don't understand the mystery, but I fell in love with Jesus when I was young. And even though there were many years I could not say that I love Jesus, I know now that Jesus was always in relationship with me. For those of you who cannot yet come to a place of saying, oh yeah, sure, I can say I love Jesus, or I can say I love God, this morning's scripture is for you as well. When Jesus says, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and later will say, and you are in me, and I am in you, it's a great circle of love. You can enter at any point in the cycle. So remember, in my Father's house there are many dwelling places, find the particular place where you can dwell. I began this morning by asking you who you love. That love can be your entrance into the open, inviting cycle of love that brings you to a loving God. For me, I long for each of you to have a relationship with God that tends your soul to hear me with your own love language. In the Episcopal tradition, we have such beautiful language. But find your love language. So for me, I join every child, and even the great theologian Karl Barth, who said, all of the gospel can be summarized in the familiar children's song, Jesus loves me, this I know. I know. It's my experience. And I pray that it may be yours as well. May it be so. Amen. Amen.